Listen up, get ready, I'm not gonna take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready, we're not gonna sit back. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Live from the Heartland. I'm Michael James up here in Chicago's blue, very blue 49th Ward, although I'm into not using the blue and red so much. We are all Americans, and we got stuff to do together. Uh, but that said, it brings me a lot of pleasure to bring on our next guest. Uh, the first time I ever met him and saw his band, Wilderness Road, and we're talking about the one and only Warren Lemming, was at Alice's Restaurant or Alice's Revisited on uh, over just off of Lincoln Avenue. And uh, it was the same day that I got sucker punched. It was a rising up angry event. We were raising money for the cause. And there was a guy from the far south side who was messed up on drugs and downers and was kind of spitting in my face. And I kind of pushed him away and I turned and uh, I said to others, get him the F out of here before the police come. And mm. just then he flew through the air and gave me a broken jaw. So I don't know if I got to hear much of your set that first in the time I saw you, Warren. Yeah, for good reason. I, yeah, yeah. I got to know, you know, uh, Wilderness Road on Columbia Records. I listened. I still listen to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, you not only had a very good musical career, but you went on to make films and do poetry and do plays, all with a bit of a political bent because you are a political animal. Animal. So. Absolutely. And I was involved with a guy named Paul Sills, uh, and he started something called Second City with some other guys, which right. everybody by this time has heard of. And then we went on to a thing called Game Theater. That's where I met Sills. Now, what drew me to that scene was not so much the games and the Viola Spola method, which is a wonderful improvisational uh, method. I even taught it at one point. What drew me to Sills was Sills was one of the first American Brechtians. OK, and Brecht was my guy uh, in the sense that I, you can look at modern theater uh, and you, but you can't you can't go around. you got to go through Brecht in order to get to modern theater because he was the theatrical genius of the 20th century, which made a lot of people on the right unhappy. It's difficult when the greatest playwright, poet, uh, dramaturgical force of the century is is an open communist that made for real problems for the state <laughs> department <laughs> and how did you discover brecht i was uh i was led to brecht through a series of um, readings that were being done actually i was studying german at the time and i was in germany and i suddenly realized that this this guy was not just a poet of genius, but but uh, here was here was the audience I'd been waiting for in terms of my own own work, and uh, I had been doing reviews, satirical reviews, et cetera, et cetera, and I had read a lot of Marx, and at that point, uh, it occurred to me that this is a guy who's really synthesized all of that thinking, and he de he de developed a performance style. Anyway, I. I wound up um, doing some work at the Berliner Ensemble, getting to know Barbara Brechtshaw, who was Brecht's surviving daughter. And it was a pretty ex exciting experience. I was in East Germany at a time when the wall was still up, and I was there at the sufferance uh, of the East German government. And uh, I had a pal from Texas who since passed to the great uh, corral beyond, but uh, Dave was a wonderful guy. And he and I, Dave McBride was his name, he's a Yale grad, and we met in Berlin and we shot a documentary, which is still around, it's called The Brecht Document. We shot a documentary with the permission of the East German government. Now, the CBS had been there two months before us wanting to do something similar, and they had offered the East Germans $200,000, uh, which and they were desperate for currency. They turned them down and went with us these two unknown socialist vagabonds in Berlin. Uh, and we got to make the Brecht documentary. They provided us with a car and uh, were more than gracious to us, I must say. Warren, was that before or after your musical career? Uh, that's well after in a sense that that's 83, 84, 85, 86. It's in that area because I had gone to Germany with the expressed idea 
of uh, working at uh, the Brecht Institute in uh, in East Berlin. I had to get permission to cross the border. And, uh, you know, it was going, uh, people would say, oh, you're going from the nightclub, that was West Berlin, to the factory, that was East Berlin. But uh, they wanted my services at the, at the factory, and the nightclub was not terribly interested. And what I had. Well, you know, you when I first knew, got to know you a little bit, you were a, a you were a pretty hot musician. You had a, a band that had some notoriety. Yeah. How did that come to an end, and you kind of moved on to your filmmaking? Well, the band, uh, the band, like all uh, good bands, uh, needs a great audience. And you remember the '60s; you were a vital part of that. And I will get a plug in for your book, which has just come out of the photographs that you did of rising up, angry power to the people. And of course, we, Wilderness Road worked a lot to raising whatever we could in the ways of money for rising up angry for the Black Panther Party, for the White Panther Party, for, for the Free John Sinclair movement. We were inextricably involved in that great, great movement that went on in the 60s, which you document so wonderfully in your book on rising up angry. And I urge everybody to call, write, phone, uh, wire Mike James and get a copy of the <laughs> Angry Story, because it really is a remarkable series of black and white photographs. I love that gritty black and white stuff. It looks better now than it's ever looked before. And you get the, a real feel of the grit. But I remember those times vividly. We were deeply involved as a band, and we had a great audience. And that great audience was also composed of some people from Rising Up Angry who would help you along in terms of your own uh, political development, because we played endless uh, free gigs uh, around um, a lot of those issues. Uh, I, I think we made a difference. I've had people come up to me decades later and said, you know, we were trying to get a little community thing going, and you guys came out and you played a free concert for us, and, 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 and we charged for it, and we made enough money to make that work. And there's a tremendous satisfaction, as you can speak to, you know, in having uh, lived within and worked within this uh, this community in Chicago and made a contribution to uh, sustaining the things and the people we want to see happen. Well, I'm glad that we're all still alive here and we can keep doing our stuff because we got right. a lot to do still. Now, let me ask uh, you. Yeah. You know, well, apropos your book, I mean, I was thinking, you know, these are the folks we need now. Yeah. Okay, was rising up anger was was doing is uh, you know is is a precursor to what's happening now, and we know there's a slow rolling, not not so slow rolling, uh, fascist coup going on. We know that Trump gets more irrational as is fascism. It is an attack on intelligence, and you see that from Trump every day, and he gets crazier and crazier, and the media gives him more and more attention. There's more attention to Trump than there is to Biden. Biden yeah. is is not is considered not good corporate media because he's he is uh you know considered uh, uh he doesn't have the star power that the media is after the media wants sensation okay and they want somebody like trump who is saying outrageous stuff about dictatorship and about upending this democracy which has been around this attempt at democracy we call the united states and uh uh, it's it's a sad fact, but uh, we we in the, in the '60s, as you know, I mean, we thought that this was going to there was going to be a blow up of some some sort, and there might even be an armed insurrection. Who knew? And yet, this is all winding out now in in and on the media as a kind of slow rolling judicial disaster. They can't, sh you know, in a system that cannot shut up, cannot contain, and cannot stop the lies. The system itself is then a lie. A system that will not shut down the lies is itself a lie. And that is the problem we're up against right now, is we're looking to these people, whether it's Merrick Garland and Justice or whatever, to come in and do something about this Trump's outrageous attacks on judges, on their wives. And, and this all, this is intimidation. This is coercion. This is Roy Cohen's pupil we're talking about Roy Cohen's Cohen's boy, okay, who as Cohen himself said, and I don't know if I can say this, I'm quoting Roy Cohen. He said, Oh, Mr. Trump, he pisses ice water. Well, that, that, <laughs> you that, can that, say that. They yeah, use, it, I've heard that word used uh, in recent years on TV and radio. Right, exactly, exactly. But we're well, 
learned some deep stuff now. And um, we, as you had pointed out, you know, we got to keep fighting. Well, we're going to. And uh, one of the things that uh, is very helpful in uh, trying to educate younger people or even people who've gone astray is to try to get them to watch some good flicks. And one of the things that I know about you, partly because you have invited me and have interviewed me a few times for some movie that you and um, your friend Hugh are making, um, mm -hmm. but you uh, you also made a couple of films. You made Algren's Last Night. Right, uh, we did, that's, that's a three. put together with a guy named Carmen Servi, yeah. An yeah. American Road in 20. Tell us about the films you've made, because I actually found uh, mm -hmm. online a whole list of stuff that you're involved with in filmmaking areas right. and, um, that I had no idea about. So tell well, us. I, about had, I had worked for, for a number of years with a guy named Dennis Miller, uh, uh, Dennis Mueller, rather, who is, is living in Burlington, Vermont, old, old pal of mine. Dennis. And we had done stuff on the Palestinians. We had done uh, a video, uh, the FBI's War on Black America which is still available, and a number of other videos having to do with, with uh, causes, et cetera. And then Kurt Jacobson and I put together a thing on the beats, uh, which had to do with American history. It's actually about the American road. And as a member of Wilderness Road, I'm, I'm well acquainted with the road. And in addition to that, I had done what I would call a kind of film noir video about Algren. It's only six or seven minutes in length, uh, called Algren's Last Night. And uh, I had done it with Carmen Serby, who was a filmmaker here in Chicago. And it's on YouTube. I urge everybody to see it. I think it's a beautiful little piece of work. And uh, out of that came a, a documentary that Dennis Mueller put together on Algren. Um, and it, that's, it, it's one of the better documentaries. There's There have only been two. There's a guy at Columbia College who did one. Uh, he interviewed the guy from the Smashing Pumpkins. What that had to do with Algren eludes me. But in any event, uh, <laughs> Dennis Mueller's uh, documentary on Algren, uh, based on, at least in part, on, on the inspiration he got from the Algren's last night that I put together, this attempt at what I'd call video noir. Um, Dennis put together a wonderful biography or a documentary rather on Algren. Tell us a little bit about Algren because uh, you, you, you made this film, but you also put on a Nelson Algren uh, yearly event and you would honor various and, activists. And I, yeah. I think the year that I didn't show up there was the year you honored me. I know my, my mm -hmm. name is on a poster. Uh, yeah. but those fun events. Tell us, tell the younger people. Did, every, every March, usually around the 28th or 29th, the 28th is August birthday party on Mar in March. We do the Nelson Algren committee, which I'm a member of a founding member of with Studs Terkel and Hugh Iglarsh and some other people. Uh, and we do a birthday party around Algren and their performers and whatnot. And uh, it's a pretty good event. And we get a couple of hundred folks who come out on a yearly basis. Uh, we had to shut down for a couple of years because of the COVID thing. We're back in business now. And it's normally at uh, uh, where I live, 2418 West Bloomingdale, which is the uh, Acme Arts Complex in uh, Wicker Park. In any event, uh, it's it's uh, it's a good event and it commemorates Algren. Algren was an American writer who was a victim of uh, not much discussed uh, McCarthyite putsch that went on in the 50s when an attack was launched by the most right-wing sources in the government and elsewhere on any progressive writer, intellectual, whatever. I mean, people lost their jobs. Uh, it's it's like what happened to the Spanish Civil War vets who came back from the anti-fascist war in Spain and were hounded by the FBI for the rest of their lives. So it's it's uh, Algren's was a sad chapter in the sense that he wrote um, uh, uh, that the, the first book, Man with a Golden Arm, which is one of the first serious studies of uh, drug addiction and what yeah. it meant to be a drug addict, and that was uh, made into a not great, great film with uh, Otto Preminger at the the wrong guy to do that sort of film. And then it was followed up by a novel that, that, that he, Algren did, A Walk on the Wild Side, which uh, Lou Reed based his song on the title. And um, uh, that's that's in itself an interesting novel, and there's an interesting film that was done uh, of that particular novel. Algren was 
1948, the winner of the National Book Award, he went on to have a, um, a mixed career in terms of, of uh, the same time he was coming to the fore. And he's a product, like all the intellectuals during the 30s of the CP and uh, their efforts to create an American literature that was leftist and progressive. And he used to hang out at the the, the Vision Street bathhouse. Right. Uh, the bathhouse was part of the yeah. help. I remember hearing that. Tell me a little bit about your film, American Road, and then uh, I want to make sure we talk about Clancy Siegel. American Road was our attempt at it. It's still available. You can get it through the internet. Or if you email me at coldchicagoco, all lowercase, one word, at gmail.com, uh, I'll send you info as to how to get it. Uh, in any event, American Road was an attempt at taking the idea of the road, whether Kerouac's on the road or just the road as a musical force, as a literary force in American life. America's always in about people moving, and usually moving west. And uh, Wilderness Road uh, had to do with that. We came up with the name uh, years ago thinking it was a good name, which of course it is, but we had no knowledge of the fact that there was a Wilderness Road, and it turns out that was the roadway from uh, the East Coast into Kentucky and Tennessee, and they were known then as the dark and bloody ground because of the Indian uh, Indian colonial settler violence. And uh, so Wilderness Road was, you know, was uh, was one of the concepts of, of the film is is about the road and the significance that the road has had for Americans, uh, literarily and otherwise. We're people who like to move, you know. Yeah. And uh, Clancy Siegel, as an American writer, lived in uh, in England for many, many years four or five really, really good uh, good books. One one on uh, the labor movement or aspects of it. Another one on uh, R.D. Lang in England. He was associated with Lang. Terrific guy. Uh, died recently and uh, taught for many years at UCLA. He's taught screenwriting. But an amazing American guy who's been under the, like many of these folks, he's under the radar, but he's worth you looking into. So, so uh, you know, Google uh, Clancy Siegel. Take a look at his. Uh, his Are you doing work. a film on Clancy Siegel? We have done a documentary on Clancy Siegel. Yes. Uh, yeah, we can make that available to people too. Again, you know, just uh, email me at uh, coldchicago, co spelled C O, at gmail.com and I will give you the info you need to. Uh, to what what is the Clancy Siegel movie named? Uh, it's just Clancy Siegel. Oh, good. That's I would like to see that one because I, I, think it's I worth remember it. when I was. Uh, I was uh, hanging out with some people who had been involved with SNCC and had left SNCC, and right. they apparently had all been, uh, you know, like the Mississippi Freedom Summer was over, et cetera. And mm -hmm. they were reading um, uh, Clancy Siegel's Going Away, which was, mm -hmm. kind of, I believe, a story about, uh, you know, longtime activist Communist Party then, um, mm -hmm. and kind of uh, – Whereas things were starting to fall down, maybe it was in the fifties under the McCarthy period. I'm not sure, but it's uh, yeah, it's the thirties too. Uh, his uh, Siegel's mother was an uh, was an organizer, and he traveled with her, and she would get dropped into these impossible situations and somehow organize people and get the union movement going. These are really amazing people. I don't I don't believe some of these biographies, and Siegel's is one, and and his mother are are, are two of these these biographies. It's uh, it harkens back to the days of Aunt Molly Jackson and the organizing around the uh, mining struggles uh, and and all the rest of it. It's an amazing amazing story. Amazing. What are you working on now, Warren? What do you got going? I'm working. I'm working on some poetry uh, which is on my Facebook site, and it's about a lot about the Trump people and the Trump regimes. And I'm trying to put together uh, the, the the rudiments of a review, which I want to stage locally since I've done a lot of review work and I like satirical reviews, it's part of the Brecht legacy. I'd like to do something on, on Trump and just, you know, the whole Trump period, which has been really extraordinary, not in the, in the best possible sense, but in, in many oh. great ways, uh, the worst possible sense. But of course, you know, for people who are satirists and I happen to be one, that's, that's always what we wait for are those moments when you really see the system and its adherence revealed. And satire is one of the ways that you do it. Uh, do you uh, have a short poem you'd like to read us? I was looking for, for something, and alas, I cannot get, get this thing to come up. Well, I'll uh, read on... it next. 
I could read it next week, or if you send me a printed view. Yeah, let's, let's do that. I'll, I'll send you some of these. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Tell me one time, what is that film that you and Hugh were shooting that you had me interview for? Well, we're doing the thing on the 60s, and uh, we're doing a lot of interviews. Yours are among them. And uh, that's still in a work in progress. So uh, I wish I wish I had more to say about it beyond the fact that it's uh, it's something we're trying to do right, and that takes time. Well, Warren Lemming, you know, you can always come back on the show, and I like uh, having you on because you're a wealth of knowledge. And I do, uh, what is the name of that play around the Civil War that you did at the Heartland? Oh, Rich Man's War, Poor Man's Fight. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and I, I also have... I also have a lot of those CDs, so if anybody's looking for a lot of original instrumentals and songs on the American Civil War, I'm your guy. So uh, it's called Rich Man's War, Poor Man's Fight, in its original material. All of it, a lot of it instrumental, a lot of it, of course, song. Yeah, I remember when we put that on at the Heartland, it was great.